CEO that uh, at a webinar held on the 3rd of December 2020. And I am the Caesar Mooks uh, Education Officer for Tasmania, working with the lovely people around the country who hopefully you've had a chance to catch up with during the last three or four years. This webinar series, or this webinar in particular, is going to be about virtual tours, uh, maps and data, and exploring the world through mapping. Just for those of you who are unfamiliar with this a particular product, I don't think we need to worry too much about the people we have here with us today, but you can just see there is a little chat area at the top. Um, you can leave your microphone muted if you're coming in a bit later, and just reactions if you wish to put a reaction up. And with my lovely friend Celia from Victoria uh, will be able to keep an eye on the chat. Before starting, I'd just particularly like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are working and living, and to recognise their continued connection to land, water and community. I pay the respect of the, to elders past, present and emerging. So welcome. This particular session um, is, is what's and is hopefully going to be a fairly practical activity. Um, I'm going to take you through a number of options around mapping, uh, where you can particularly look at data and how you might utilise data to engage your children in digital technologies. We'll start with looking at what a virtual tour is. We'll have a look at Google Expeditions and virtual tours. And you'll see a caveat there that I've got until June 2021, which I'll explain in a moment. There'll be some materials required for creating our own virtual tour. There'll be exploring the use of maps for virtual tours and exploring the world and how to share a tour. So what is needed for a virtual tour? Well, let me just say it from the beginning. Um, prior to this uh, session being organised, um, or just after the session was organised, an uh, email came through to some of us saying that virtual tours or Google's virtual creating was going to be no longer produced or supported after June, July, 2021. So I did throw a bit of a dilemma into how we would start this and continue with this webinar. We're going to do it anyway, um, because that still gives us six months to have a bit of a play and to give you a bit of a chance to see that you don't necessarily need to have expensive equipment to create some very exciting options for your students. Google have had a number of options around creating tours before, which we will look at, and they've moved from Google Earth Builder to Google Earth. So that will be effectively not a complete replacement to virtual tours, but some options for teachers to create virtual tours for their, or tours for their students using maps. I'm going to look at Google Expeditions, and some of you may have been to some of the Google um, workshops in the past, and you'll notice that the banner here with the little flag in the middle is available on your uh, mobile device, whether it be an Android or uh, uh, iPad, iPhone. Um, we'll look at that briefly and how to share and make your own Google Expedition. We have Google Cardboards, which um, I have just here, a Google Cardboard. These are purchasable cheaply through Google. Uh, you can go to the website. These create a little VR headset, oops, sorry, a little VR headset for you. Um, you can go to templates for Google Glasses and using cardboard make your own, but for five or six dollars, they're a fairly inexpensive resource. The camera that we're looking at here is um, an Insta360 um, One R. The camera that's available for the Caesar MOOC Lending Library, which I must emphasize uh, is uh, still available uh, until the end of the year, which is not much longer, uh, but just going to hiatus for a while and hopefully those library or lending library kits will become available again. But the cameras and the uh, equipment required for the, uh, doing virtual tours are available in part of the Google, uh, the Caesar MOOC website uh, and on their Caesar MOOC library, the lending library, the links for that, which we'll show you later. And we're going to look at a very, a very simple uh, replacement, if you wish, for those of you who don't have one of the cameras, which is on your iPhone or your Android phone, which will allow you to create your own uh, 360 degree virtual world. I'm going to take you through now to um, the Tour Creator website. And if you do have access and can, uh, you might like to have a look at this 
So I'm going to do a, a brief tour of how you would operate a virtual tour. When you first come into the website, you end up with this front page. This is the tour creator of the virtual tour website and you just simply click the get started button. Once you're inside there, you, if you're, you, have it, you, will, you will need a Google account. And on that page, there won't be the ones you see here. There'll be a blank page with a get started or a new tour. These are some examples that I've taken in recent weeks to give uh, you a chance to see how this might operate. Let's have a look at this one here. This is Battery Point. Now, Battery Point is a historic suburb in Tasmania. Some of you may have been here on tours. And the purpose of creating a virtual tour was to give children and adults an opportunity to, to don some glasses, whether they be a virtual reality glasses or just to do a tour in Google Expeditions just by having a look at still maps, um, which you can turn uh, on a 360 degree axis. So let's have a look at this one here. This is a map that's been created. Um, if I click on this particular one, it loads the tour. So when you're creating a tour, you get an opportunity to bring in a photo, a still image, which you can bring in from your lending, your um, iPhoto library or your photo library in Google. You can give your title to your site, which you can change at any time. And you can give a brief description. This is what you would see if you were using the Google Expeditions app. Along the bottom, it will have an add a scene button. So when I click add scene, it says, whereabouts are you? And you would put in your address. In this case, it would be Battery Point, Tasmania. And the button here at the top, which I hope you can see, allows you to upload. You have had to take your 360 degree photo or your photos to bring into this area, which is where we'll just come to now. What I'll do is I'll go back now to this particular page here um, in your virtual tour, go back into getting started again. And if you've got your camera and we, because of the numbers of people who are with us today, I won't actually get you to do too much on this. I've taken some photos here which will allow you to use a, your smartphone to create your own Google 360 degree image. We'll come back to Street View in a moment, but from Street View back into Google Tour. If you haven't got a 360 degree camera, just use your, um, your phone. So with your phone, this is a step-by-step -step activity you go to the Google Street View app, which you will have downloaded, it's free of charge. Once you have downloaded that, you'll end up with the screen here that you can see. It's a fairly blank screen. If you want to have a look at other people's street views, many of you will have seen this in using Google Maps if you're traveling and you can see the little um, yellow man, little peg man, and you can drag that down to the street and you get a 360 degree view of the street you're in. This is what you're going to create now. Down the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a small camera. If you click on that camera, you'll end up with this particular scene here, which is a sort of a blank scene. And at the bottom, it says, take a photo. It's this bottom one here that you want. So with your camera, you click that button and I've started to take photos here and I've stopped just to capture the screen. You will see a white dot appear in the middle of the screen. Or it's, well, it'll be an orange dot to start with. You move the camera to the orange dot. So you'll move the camera to the orange dot. You don't have to push a button, you just hold it there and it will spin around and become a white dot. You move the camera up, you'll see another orange dot to the left, to the right, below and above you. The purpose of this is to just, without holding, the, you don't have to push the buttons, you just hold the camera and you find every orange dot on the page. And once you've found every orange dot on the page, they will all turn white. You see the little orange tick at the bottom here, that will go green. When it's gone green with a green tick, that means you've captured all 360 degrees of the image around you. So you need to stand in one space and move around in this full 360 degree circle 
moving the cam up, down, right up to the ceiling and right down to your feet until you've captured all the photos that make up and stitch a photo. So I'm now going to go back to Tour Creator. And in Tour Creator, you can see that we're going to create some of our own tours in this particular space. Um, Peter, can I just yes. ask a question at this point? When you're taking those photos, are they automatically public? No, they're not. You can make them public. That you, what will happen is a little peg man will run along the screen back and forth on, on the screen um, once you've got all the photos captured, uh, all the orange dots, and it will say that you can say make public or you can share it or not share it. Okay, so schools um, yep. don't need to worry, worry no, about it. No, the, and these, these tour creator photos also, and that's a great question, Celia, are all unlisted unless you make them public. Okay, thank you. So Sorry, that's a fantastic question. Hello. Yep. So let, let's let's say we go to the Cradle Mountain Lake Sinclair National Park. This is the one I've just we've been to Lake Sinclair. We've taken some photos. I showed you battery point. They're all much the same. I've dragged in a photograph of um, part of Lake Sinclair and given it a title. And you can choose which part of the tour you think this will be. Is it social? Is it science? Is it sport fitness? In this case, it's nature. And you've got a publish button here, which we'll come to in a moment. Along the bottom, you'll see that I have already created some scenes. So I click on these. And these are the sort of thing that I've done with the 360 cameras provided in the Caesar MOOC website. Uh, sorry, the Caesar MOOC lending library. And as you move the mouse around, you end up with, and this is on Lake Narcissus, or sorry, Lake Sinclair on the way to Narcissus Hut. And I've gone right down there. You see here, there's a shadow of the camera. So I've discovered that it's probably better to do this. And that shadow is actually just a bit of plastic tubing. And I, I can't quite see it. And a, a selfie stick, which I put up onto the camera to hold it. If you were to take the photo in the shade, you wouldn't get the shadow of the stick. You can on the camera, oops, sorry. You can on the cameras also have them uh, a timer, which means you can run behind a bush <laughs> or a stone so you're not in the photo, which is what I did in this particular case. So yeah, the camera will actually, oh, sorry, the camera will actually do a timed um, image. Here's another one here, this is Echo Point. And in Echo Point, another part of the, you'll see this eye. So every time you're on one of your photos, you can actually put in a new, point of interest. And those of you who've used Google Expeditions will be very familiar with this. You can have the children, once they've got expeditions on, um, be pointed to a particular direction and then see some instructions or not actually see the instructions, but the person who's actually doing the expedition, which is the teacher usually, can read the instructions out. So in this particular case, this is little Hugel and here's some information about little Hugel here. And so, and so on and so forth. You just work your way through different points of interest. We have teachers at, this is uh, on the, in the rainforest and the Lake Sinclair Walk. Um, and you can see that the, the products that you get with the camera are pretty spectacular. And then you get to Narcissus Hut, which is the other end of, which is the lake near the hut at the end of Lake Sinclair. And the purpose of this is to give children understanding of the world that they live in and also to give them a virtual tour in a, in a VR landscape. Now, as I said before, how do you add a scene? Each time you've created a scene, it's got it on the right hand side, it says add scene. So if I click on add scene, it'll say, what do you want to do? Where about this particular place or upload? So I'll go to upload and I'll go and select an image that I've taken previously. And I'll go across to my folders of photos, which I have in my photo album, my pictures album, and King Island is one of the ones. So this is not like some clip, but this is another area. So if I take this photo, I can have a quick look and I take the photo. So this is how the photo appears before you put it into your, um, project. So it's not 360, it's it's just a straight stretched out photo. If I add that scene, 
you can see now I've got a 360 degree photo taken with the camera. If I want to add, uh, I can give a scene a title, which is just saying a lighthouse. I'll just call it lighthouse for the moment. And a location where it might be, a description, any credits. You can bring an audio. There are some sound files you can bring in um, basing carefully on copyright that you don't bring in music that you can't uh, use lawfully. Uh, but if you're doing it for just your personal use, it's fine, I'm sure. But here we are, or you can give a voiceover, add some narration to it, a voice narration. And that's very useful for children um, with disabilities and for adults, of course. And you can add a point of interest. So if point of interest, you can move around where you'd like your point of interest to be. So you can add your point of interest anywhere. Once you click on it, you can add, give it a title and a description. And, and so you go, you keep adding the scenes to your work. So I'll show you one of the, the um, tasks now that we I've done uh, with some students on Flinders Island, where we created photographs because we only had the um, camera to work with at the time. So I'll just come back out of here and show you one that's been done by some students. Now the students at Flinders Island have been given uh, the lending library kit and they're working at the moment on building their own lending library, uh, their own, sorry, their own tour of Flinders Island. So we've got different scenes here. So this one's Flinders Island Wharf. This was taken using the camera, just the camera and Google Street View. Now it's, it's pretty good and it costs nothing to use. The only point you sometimes get is there may be a mismatch in the, in the pixel matching. It's a really nice, um, if you're looking at the Caesar MOOCs F to six uh, MOOC, you will see that there's a very nice description on pixels being put together uh, and another one on audio and images put together by Rebecca Vivian, uh, Dr. Rebecca Vivian at the Caesar at Adelaide University, talking about how pixels, and if you zoom in, you would see how these pixels are mismatching on here. But this is really a 360 degree using just your camera. Peter, so you, you, mean, you mean your phone camera? Us, yeah, your phone camera. Just the, oh. thank, thanks, Sid, yeah. Just the phone that, camera. No, nope. yeah. so we use just the phone. Um, and once again, everything that you wish to do equally applies. How do you publish this? Uh, that, because we want to move on to a couple of other things. I'm just very conscious of the time. If you go to publish at this particular point and you're happy, you can always come back, as you saw I did. You just come back in at any time and you can pop photos in at any time. You go to publish and you'll notice the first question, and it was a question raised by Celia, which was a very good one. It's unlisted. You can, if you wish to, make it public and you can share the, the link. If I make it unlisted and publish it, it will give you a URL, which is unique to your site. And it's in what they, at the, it's a website called Poly. You can view the, view the tour, or you can just copy that address and send it to the class to use in a Google expedition. If I go view the tour, you have some other sharing options. And you'll notice here, of course, <laughs> there's very unfortunate banner saying, they had better download this to your library because it's going to disappear. Um, under the bottom here, you'll see some options. One is share. If I click on the share button, there's some fantastic options to share. One is you can embed this into your own school website if you wish to. The other one is to create a Google expedition for it, which is what we've been doing with students. There's also Twitter and Facebook, which have limited use for teachers and schools. But if you click on expeditions, this will become available in your expedition library. Now, because I'm in my Google account and, I've, and I am in my Google account, as you'll see up here, there's my Google account it will go into my Google Expeditions account. So when I now go to my iPad, 
go to Google Expeditions, in my library will be the Flinders Island Library, which I can then share with my students in the classroom. Now, there is a caveat to this, which we discovered on Flinders and King Island. You, Flinders and King Island only work um, with Telstra. There is no Optus connection. Because we didn't have um, connectivity within the school because of the peer-to-peer -peer restrictions for students, uh, the Adelaide University have um, access and provide access to um, the CESAR team of uh, Wi-Fi, which will create a small uh, hub within your school, sort of a wireless connection for um, privacy within your classroom. The students would see if they went into their phones when they or their to load their phone into their Google Cardboard, they would then connect up, not to the school Wi-Fi because that won't help them, they'll connect up to the little Wi-Fi device that's in the classroom. The Google Expeditions run by the teacher will also connect up to the same internal classroom Wi-Fi connection and then they can do the Google tour. So I guess you're saying there, Pete, they need to check your internet connections before you do. You start yeah. to try these sort of things yeah. now many many schools will find it difficult to do these within the school environment because of the restrictions within schools about peer-to-peer -peer sharing um, for obvious reasons that doesn't always um, uh, it creates problems for security within schools mm -hmm. however one of these smaller little devices and they're just the wi-fi hot wi-fi hotspots um, similar to your phone hotspot but they just allow you to have multiple access, multiple users access a small internal network. It doesn't have access to the internet. It just has access to around within your school um, for sharing within the classroom. Well, it does have access to the internet because it is a Wi-Fi hotspot, but you've got your students under control really, if you like, um, and you control the hotspot, which you can turn off at any time. And look, that's a very much of a Cook's tour. The, sad, the, the disappointing aspect of this is that this has been such a wonderful result um, for the School of Flinders Island. In the back here, you can see the Mount Strezlecki in the background um, and the ability to be able to tell the children or share with the children a Google expedition uh, of any part of the world has been really fantastic. Um, I'm sure many teachers watching this would be uh, able mm. to see other purposes for it as well as these beautiful scenery. We could use it within schools um, for school tours and all, all sorts Absolute, of Absolutely and that's what we're hoping the children of Flinders Island will do is to find spaces, uh, space, places of significance to them as students on this island of 700 people that um, they'd like to share with the world. So that we hopefully have that shared with them eventually. So I've got, so this is, that's Google um, virtual tour, which we were going to spend a little bit more time on and get you to have a bit of a go with yourselves, but it's, a, it, it's operating at the moment. It's free of charge. Um, you just really do need a Google Cardboard, some form of way of communicating, um, building your camera photos, which would be to use just your phone. In most cases, that's all you need. Um, and it works particularly well for students. Just going to go and move on now to the next section, which is to have a look at how we've created a tour here and how we've shared it, and we've used Google Street View. But there are other aspects to mapping which are really, really worthwhile sharing, and some of those are the particular parts around use of data and maps. And we'll if we get a bit of time towards the end, I'll show you some work we've been doing in another role, um, building up. Uh, uh, lesson plans around mapping for students and use of data. So Google Earth, I'm going to, there's a website that we've created um, to do some activities and this, whoops, that's gone too quickly. These activities are on the website here, which um, are at the back of this particular um, tutorial today, this webinar. And this is the website. It's just called livingmaps.weebly.com. It's just a free um, web-based tool, which I've used to build this site with most of the links that you need. So you don't need to take any notes for this. They're just here. So let's have a look at some of the maths, uh, the mapping activities that make working with maps and using data such an exciting and valuable task. So. One I like to use in class when I have a chance to use a class, work with a class, is one called GeoGuessr. So GeoGuessr 
is a, a great way for children to see if they can be good observers of their of their place and places around the world. These have been built with exactly the sorts of things that we've just been doing with Google um, Street View or Tour Creator or some other tool, a 360 degree camera or just a phone. So you can go and say, I want to go and explore the world and children have to be fairly astute and to look and see if they can, um, we're not going to do a, a join up with them at all. We're just going to have a bit of a go. And there's a whole range of tools here that you can use to create. Now I've logged into this before. Um, you can browse maps. You can have an explorer mode where it asks you to explore the world. You can see different parts of the world only for US centric. And you can start collecting medals in your class about where you might be. You can choose different countries that you want to work in. You might have a particular country you're doing in, in geography or history that you wish to have work with. Um, you need to be in your own account. So if you create a Google account, you can do so with that. But generally, it's just, you don't need to upgrade to Pro, you don't need to pay for anything. But this will give you a chance to go and explore in GeoGuess a, a part of the world. So let's just see if we can play a game now. So world play. No, no free games left. I've, I've used my game today, which was a mistake. Um, and I'll probably use my game today too. So you get a chance every day to do it once unless you buy the purchase. But what you will get is a similar sort of photograph that you saw before on Flinders Island. And you might be asked as a student to see which part of the world this is. And it, they will have to look carefully for street signs, which may be in a different language. Uh, it could be whether the car is driving on the left or right hand side of the road and they take a guess as to which part of the world they think they are. Um, if they get it right, they get a point and if not, um, they get told to be where it is. So the pictures aren't as obvious as that one? No, be no, they're not. <laughs> and, and Celia and I had a go this morning and it was just a country lane. It could have been anywhere. There was, so some of them are completely obscure and you just have no idea where you are. So we'll go back to here. Um, <clears throat> the next one is My Maps. Now, I'm particularly fond of My Maps. The My Maps website, that link on that website that you've got there to look at, um, will take you straight to just click on Get Started. Now, you do need to be in your Google account. And in My Maps, it's part of your Google suite uh, under Google Drive. There are some fantastic activities. One of the ones is um, now that I like, I do like this one. And Google Drive, you can create all sorts of tasks for your children to think about the world. So I've put a map around, very roughly around Australia, and it's doing that all on its own, and it shouldn't be. I'll move that out of the way. So in Australia we have, so how, how does Australia compare, for example, to Greenland? So using the tools to draw around by clicking on it, you'll see that you've got little dots. I've just made little dots. I can drag that. Now, who thinks Greenland is bigger than Australia based on what they can see on the map? See, you, you're there. What do you think? Is Greenland bigger than Australia? Uh, I'd say yes. Okay, so we move our map, noticing that the proportions haven't changed. And as we move higher up, Australia is actually much bigger than Greenland. You tricked me. I did. And you can see how it compares to the United States, Africa. Africa is very big. When you see where Australia fits in Africa, we realize what a large country it is and across to South America. So having the children just realize that the way a map is drawn and proportions, um, fantastic in maths to do that. That's, um, so in, in this product, um, we've got, I'll close off these ones, we're done with Street View. Google, I'll close that one off as well. There's a bit more space. Under here, under my maps, um, there are some really lovely uh, activities around here, I'll close that one off as well, which will allow its children to explore the world as we've just done there in a particular way. 
So let me show you. Going back to the website. Mind maps will uh, allow you to um, create your own map and bring in data. So for example, if you're asking the children about parks and playgrounds that they might enjoy playing in this Hobart City Council, for example, here in Tasmania or in your own particular area, there is a website which um, holds data for all parts of Australia. The website that you'll find for that is under um, Maps of Reality, Australian data sets. And that simply is called data.gov.au. Now, when you're creating a data set or wanting to find a data set, you don't want to have to go and create and do all the searching for the for all the parks, for example, in your own area. When you get to this particular site, I've just written my town. So this is a national data set. Once you've done that, you do need to find the format that you want to bring into your Google map, my maps. You go to any format and you choose a CSV file. This is a straightforward computer um, comma separated um, spreadsheet. And there's 122 CSV files on Hobart, which I want to find. You may have more or less. You'll see here that there's data sets on contours of Tasmania, on Hobart, sorry, faces for curbs, things that are pretty unimpressive. Or, but there's one on playgrounds. And you'll see it's a CSV file. And if I click on that data set, it will show you that where they are here and you can open up on a national map. But the nice thing for your students to do is to see how the data can be brought in from a spreadsheet and into a map. So you can download the data um, and place that, you've got the objects here, and here are the files, and there's a CSV file there, which you can download. Now I've downloaded that file. There's all sorts of other files that you'll notice there as well, KML files, shape, but some of these I don't know what they do, but they're all data sources. So I download the CSV file and I go back to my My Maps. So in My Maps, This is what I've created, but I'll show you how I did that. Here is the data from that map. And if I wanted to look at all those maps, you can give, you give the layer a name and you add layers if you wish to, but you import, you can rename layers, you can delete them and so on. You can preview your work and you can then import into your, now they don't look particularly friendly, these aspects, but when you click over to your map, you will see that you get the data that came off the CSV file. So let's just create a new map here. And I'll go back to a new map. I can. So what you will have is a, just a map like this and you'll see the import button. When you click on import, what you'll be looking for, you wanna upload a file, which you need to file from your photo, from your files, and you need to go into, hopefully I've got it here. There will be a CSV file of playgrounds and locations. I click on that and you'll get some questions to answer. And one is the first one is where is this object? So it might be just park name and you can continue. And the second one will be your X and Y locations. So you need, this is, it looks as though you have a lot of things. I mean, you could click on dogs off leave, but when you finish that, it will say it can't necessarily match those files together because it's what it's looking for is a data on longitude and latitude. So for the students, and you'll get questions like this, which don't really help me because you can see where the maps, I mean, I've got 
things here that obviously don't exist. So what you need to do, is I'll go to a new map again, just to start again. When you go to import your data and you go to upload your file, you go to your city of Hobart playground, as you go through, you'll see one of them is object ID, longitude or latitude. So make sure that one of them, the first or second one is longitude or latitude. So this time I'm just gonna go park name and say continue. Then the next one, the last one, I'll say I want longitude and latitude. And all things being equal, now, for older children, this is straightforward, but you'll see now, hopefully I'm getting more and more data, which will be around Hobart. And you move into this and you'll end up with a map in your My Maps, which I'll show you here, rather than go through all the data, which has got Hobart Playgrounds. Which will show you all the all the playground data that's come through. Although that's giving me another one again. Peter, there's also the way of collecting the data by you, um, yourself via a Google form, and then yes. importing that into a My Map, which works really well. And that way, they have control over the data they're using. Yes, well. that's a good one too. And also, when they go back into the if they go back into their spreadsheet too, which is already good. Uh, technology, digital technology activity too. They can see the data. Yeah. They'll Learn see the longer data before, the, before it's used. Yeah, before it's utilised. Yeah. Now it's not always straightforward, um, but that that gets started. But it there will always give you a chance to have a bit of a play and see the sorts of maps. So it, when you have got the data correctly in, you do need to make sure you've got the longitude and latitude correctly, and that will then put in the data. And they can start adding things like websites to it as well. So it's quite a useful way of getting children to explore the world, similarly to what we did before with the Flinders Island, the Battery Point and so on with the, my, the Street View. Now I'll move through this quite quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but um, go back to the beginning. I'll move my little picture out of the way here. Go back to the activity to try. So we're back again on this map that we were using before. There was some very nice work done um, under Google Lit Trips. Now it's an old site. It's been around for many, many years, which allowed um, teachers to bring in stories and place those particular places like Grapes of Wrath was a particularly good story to show where particular events happen in the story. Um, one more suitable possibly for younger children would be Possum Magic. Now this is using Google Earth. Now in Google Earth, what we've done here, you can create in Google, you can create the story of Poss as you try to find a way around the parts of the country. And when you turn on all the links for it, you can actually start to explore Possum magic and where places were that took place in the story. So the Lamingtons, Anzac Day Biscuit, or Anzac Biscuits in Adelaide, in Brisbane, pumpkin scones, and so on. And Tasmania, I think, was Lamingtons. Pete, we're not actually seeing that screen. Oh, you're not seeing that screen. No, we can see the, the title of Google Lits, but not the not the Possum Magic. Oh, okay. So that's, that's actually sitting up on the screen for me and that's not showing up. So that's that didn't come at all. Ah. Interesting. Given the time, it's probably time to move move on. Yeah. To the Okay, so Google Lit Trips is another wonderful, wonderful. Can you see the Google Lit Trips page now at the moment? Yes. Okay. Briefly going through the other parts of it. There's, we did, when I was working in um, another jurisdiction, the Catholic Education Office, we did something along the. Now, can you see that page? 
um, Sylvia? Yes, we can see that. Okay, this is walking the, the Dolorosa, uh, Stations of the Cross. Um, we had a little bit of a project called STREAM, Science, Technology, Religious Education, Arts and Mathematics, which we thought was clever. Um, <laughs> and in this particular case, it allowed us to, once again, add to a map the Stations of the Cross. So you can add onto your map some data information, a point of information that you wanted to share, and you can include videos as well. So whenever you wanted to add a space or add a particular place, you could add it to your map. And when you're in that particular section, you can change the color of the pointer. You can add a photograph and choose a photo from somewhere on your camera or on your computer. You can color particular sections or put some text in about that, give it a name. Or you can delete it. So very similar to the work that was done um, for the Possum Magic story, which you couldn't see on the is you can actually start on the map adding points. So I really enjoyed working with children on this particular, it showed them the world using the Google Maps environment to really explore places in history that they may have heard about, but not actually really visualized where they were. A great way to get students to do their local environment too, wouldn't it? Their local area. Oh, fantastic, <laughs> really good. And, and, and to share the local environment with others. Um, the, this one I was gonna talk about before was Maps in Reality. This one here is also on that website. Just like a bit like the Greenland one, this is Australia and the US. Russia on the equator is not a giant bear anymore. When you move it down to the equator, it looks only part of Africa, but it looks huge. And you see it on map. Looking at uh, Romania, there's an island on the Arctic Ocean. There it is actually, looks quite large in the Arctic Ocean, but it's actually quite a small country. There's Australia and Europe, but its actual position is there. So this is quite a nice website for children. And you could then do the same thing by getting to trace around in my maps part of the world and moving it to see just the comparison and sizes and reality. Um, Live Earth, I, as, a I, as a geographer in my early life, um, I love this. This is real, this is real data. So this is the, the currents of the wind at the moment, live from the satellites. The data is being shared onto this map. And you can go down to the bottom left-hand corner. Can you see that, Celia? Yep. And along here, for example, you can put the temperature overlay. Now for Australia at the moment, you can, the colors tell you the scale of heat. Tasmania, I'm wearing a jumper, as you may notice. Um, but I'm sure my counterparts, if you're watching this in Northern, Hemis Northern parts of Tasmania or not, uh, Australia are not. Um, so you can change the temperature. Um, wind. Currents. Waves. And this is all real data. It's live data. I think it's such a, it's a beautiful map to explore. And children can see, for example, how winds might be moving in a different direction in the Northern Hemisphere. You might ask them to look at what happens to the water in the plug hole and ask a counterpart in the Northern Hemisphere which direction the water goes down a plug hole in North America, for example. Or they could take a screenshot of the wind and the temperature ones and then work out, you know. Yes, out. yes, absolutely. That's a really good idea. Back again to the activity to try. We looked at the live earth data. There's some Australian data sets. This is the data set we talked about before. So this is data.gov.au. The census website too is very good. The Australian census website's another place to get good data. We have, as in other states, uh, utilities such as the hydro and the hydro keep live data running all the time, which we can map. And that looks at lake levels, for example, in Tasmania. And you can see the lake levels and whether they've risen or fallen in different lakes. And this is all live data. 
where it says it's spilling, that means that the, 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 the lake is actually full and overflowing. So in drought times, that's really useful for students to be able to see that. We've looked at the Hobart City Council data sets. Now, Google Expeditions, um, I've just put this website up for people who want to download it. This is gives a nice little explanation on Google Expeditions and where to get the website. This is an iPad or iPhone or Google um, Android uh, device will allow you to use the uh, maps that you create in Google Tool Creator to also do the same thing in um, Expeditions. She Maps is been put together by um, in Queensland, and I'll just show you this here. It's been put together um, show by Karen, uh, by Rhonda Jones, as one of the teachers here. Now, this particular site has been put together to get children, uh, and it does talk about drones in particular place about looking down on the worth of your planet and seeing how it is. But one of the activities we've been using is how to map my school. And in this map my school activity, you can download a brochure. And the task is for primary and secondary which allows children to start to explore their map. And we ask the children to uh, find all the shady spaces in their school and work out the percentage of shade and how they might increase shade, particularly in those warmer climates where shade is um, maybe scarce and sunscreen um, is important. And keeping out of the sun is important in the middle of the day. We created in um, one of my roles in, in a, another job. This one is a part of Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies Assessment Task. We worked with SheMaps, uh, the team there, to build an assessment task for prep one, two, three, fours, five, sixes, seven, eights, and nine, tens. Mm. So, how do you cool your school to make it less? Uh, dangerous to be outside. And this is a grade three, four activity. And you can see here, we've got the assessment focus of the Australian curriculum. And we're looking at how to align around F2, looking at there, then we look at this is a three, four activity. These, these particular assessment tasks will appear on the Australian curriculum website. And we looked at maps as we've been doing for the last 45 minutes. And then we come along to Looking at systems, for example, a computer is a system made up of a, a number of components. Some background information for the teacher. These will all be published eventually. So, and then there's a task here, which is by the end of year four, this is what we expect in the assessment. Students will describe how a range of digital systems, hardware or software. So we were looking at using a system as being the school and how it works together and how you might make it shady and cool. So for example, collecting, assessing and presenting different types of data, which we've been looking at for the last 45 minutes and using simple software to create information. So in the particular task the students did here, they used a program called Scribble Maps, which is once again, I've got a link. And Scribble Maps allows you to draw roughly around your school and highlight in different colors shady areas, hot areas, and so on, or any particular color you want to, to define parts of the school. And students can find out what sort of solutions to meet a common personal school or community need. So these fit in very nicely, and they also tie to Scootle, uh, the Scootle links as well. So it's a digital system activity, involves system design and computational thinking, and involves sustainability and the cross-curricular activity. So this is the sort of activity, this one's nearly finished and to be published. And there's an assessment rubric that goes with it. And I know it's a bit fast to go through this, but you can see the detail we've put into each of these projects for, for teachers. And then some links that will go through to the Australian curriculum and the content descriptors. And 
So keep a look out for those. Um, they're, they're, they're coming up through. Now I'm very conscious of the time. I've only got a few more minutes to go. So this is the brochure under She Maps, where she maps my school. And this is the whole activities around the She Maps program. They run regular workshops at, um, online through webinars as well. We've looked at Google Expeditions. We looked at the sources of data. And Scribble Maps is the particular program that I was talking about just a moment ago, where it's very simple to use. You can just use it as a free program. You don't have to pay for it at all. And you just go and you can request or just create a map. And you can just create your own map now. So you've put in a Google uh, address and it built, so you put your school address in and Google map will appear with your school. And then you can map around the school. Once again, I'm just gonna close these off, make sure I've covered everything that we were talking about. And for those of you who might have missed uh, and have just come in now to join us, this is the website that will um, be on the back of the uh, webinar, which will have the link. If you wanted to copy that down now, it's just livingmaps.weebly.com. I'm sorry you couldn't see the possible magic one. Um, now, Google Earth is the final thing I want to talk about briefly because Google Earth is a replacement for Tour Creator. And it has been promoted as the replacement by Google for June 21st. Now, it's been around for a while. If you launch Earth, it has a very impressive start. And I'll finish off with a little bit of a video that they've started here now and show you how that you can create your own virtual tours in a way. But the little video, um, hopefully this will work okay. Um, we'll just have a quick look at this here. Under, you can create your own projects. And it gives you an example of how you might create a project. I created one on Tasmania. But if you want to, you just go new project, create a project in your Google folder. You do need to have a Google account and it saves these files what they call as KML files. So it's a little bit different. And let's just have a look here what they've got for us. There are some different projects and there was a little video that I was going to show you earlier, but I just need if I can find it as I go through here, I'll just close off these files now the ones we've looked at today. I think we just about covered all of them, Celia. Yep, I think These that's one of your last maps. But yes, it was the last one. We looked at the maps there. And I think we have one over here. This is one I did using Google Tour Creator by putting a map. So when you make your own Google, Google Earth, you go a new project, you give it a name and a title. You can add a new feature. So example, I've got Hobart and it will go into Hobart and zoom in. You can choose the, the view you want it to look like. So it's not quite like the virtual tour that you have um, with your VR headset. But you can, for example, I go to Richmond Bridge, it will take you back out and will take you to Richmond. And you can choose a particular direction or view of the bridge that you'd like it to be. And you can see you've got some 2D and 3D options around how you might see that. You can also get some information about the bridge and you can zoom in if you wish to, to get a bit closer to it. And it's the oldest bridge in Australia. Let's finish off with a tutorial now to show you how it works. And hopefully this will work. Now, Celia, let me know if it doesn't. Um, watch tutorial. Try that again, should be appearing somewhere. <laughs> Maybe behind this picture of us. No, not there. 
coming up. I'll just refresh the page and see what happens. But Google Earth is, the, is um, going to be the replacement for the work, the Google um, tour, virtual tours and so on. So it's, it, it will work uh, a little bit differently, but we'll give you some analysis of the watch tutorial works. And there we go, I think. Can you hear the voice? In this video, we're going to talk about how to add features in Google Earth. We'll show you how to add place marks, lines, shapes, street view, and slides to your project. Let's start by adding a place. In Google Earth, click the search button and search for a place you'd like to add to your project. Once you find a place you like, click the Add to Project button in the Knowledge Card. You can save a place to a new project, or if you've already created a project, you can save to one of your existing projects using the drop-down menu. Don't forget to click Save. The place will now appear in the list of features in your project. You can also add places by dropping a placemark directly on the globe. Click the Add Placemark button in the toolbar, then click on the globe to drop the placemark. Give your place a title and save it to your project. Now, let's add a line. Click the Draw Line or Shape button in the toolbar and click on the globe to draw your line with a series of points. To save your line, press Enter. Give your line a title and save it to your project. Now, let's add a shape. You use the same tool, the Draw Line or Shape button in the toolbar, to draw a shape. Click the button in the toolbar and click on the globe to draw your shape. Close your shape by clicking on your first point. Give your shape a title and save it to your project. You can also add a favorite street view image. Click the pegmen to see the blue lines and dots that show where street view is available. Click on a blue line or dot to enter street view. Set up the view you want. Click the Capture Street View button in the toolbar to save the view and give it a title. There's one last feature that we haven't covered yet, slides. You can also add a full screen slide to your project as an introduction, section break, or ending. Click the Add to Project button. You'll see that you can add place marks, lines, shapes, and slides from this menu. Select Full Screen Slide. Here in the Property Editor, you can design your slide with an image, a title and description. You can reorder any slides or places in your project. So if you've made an intro slide, then you can drag and drop it into the first place on the list. To see your finished project, click Present. Use the previous and next buttons in the table of contents to journey through your project. Now you know all about features you can use to build your Earth project. Go ahead and start adding. So it's a little different to the virtual reality tour that you get, but it's got some clever additions to it, but I, I, I am a little disappointed that we haven't continued to keep um, Google Tour Creator as well. So just to finish off, um, very conscious of time, this has been a real uh, real pleasure to do this little webinar. It, it did actually force me to go back and look at mapping, which I hadn't looked at for a little while, to realise how tightly it fits in with a lot of what happens in the digital technologies curriculum. Uh, especially around the use of data from very early years right through to senior years. The Computer Science Education Research Group has been uh, a, a very wonderful project and continues to be, um, not only for the online courses, the MOOCs that you'll find on the CESA MOOC website, but also for the lending library, which includes these VR kits that are now available through um, application to the lending library. You'll find on the Computer Science Education website which is the one down the bottom here and i've also put down the resources that i use today which not only in the living um, maps website the weebly page here but also some of the ones we talked about through today here are the actual courses that are being run um, even though we're just going to a little bit of a hiatus over the holiday period these MOOCs are online and they're available now and I know that uh, my colleagues Celia and Tony and others have been working very, very hard on the cybersecurity and awareness and 
the AI in the classroom MOOCs in the recent months, and they've proven to be very, very successful and popular. So just to finish off with a thank you for those of you who are able to attend us today, and please do keep in touch. Um, this is one of the CESAR activities that we've been running for the last uh, number of months. And uh, I think this may well be the last one, Celia. I think it might be. So thanks, Pete. I'm going to stop the recording. Well done. So many resources you just shared. Thank you. Thanks, Celia. <laughs>